The Audacity of She. Incisive conversations with women who are challenging the status quo to create wildly fulfilling lives. Plus, practical information you can apply to your life right now. Hi, so happy to have you back here again this week. I've been getting really great feedback on the show, and I know you're loving the real world conversations. What I hear most is that you find it refreshing to hear that you're not alone in going through things in your life, and you love seeing powerful examples of women who have faced difficult times in their lives and really used those experiences as a catalyst to create meaningful change. The truth is that the women on the show are unique in that they rose to the challenge, But we all have the opportunity to do the same, so I'm thrilled to keep sharing these stories and I'm so happy that they are inspiring you. My one ask is, if you've benefited from this show, that you write a review on iTunes. Just a few words is all it takes and it is invaluable in helping get the message out to even more women. I believe that our true nature is abundant and unstoppable. When we come together and celebrate what we've accomplished, when we honor both the good and bad times, and when we support each other in our growth and development, we create a powerful space for women to thrive. I'm so honored to share this little nook of the web, and I'm thrilled that you're along for the journey. So without further ado, we'll jump into today's content. This conversation is with Megan Watson. Megan is a personal stylist and founder of Watson Style Group, a firm dedicated to creating wardrobes that practically hand you your outfit each time you get dressed so you can feel the way you want and love the way you look. If you've ever felt less than confident in what you're wearing or spent way too much time in the closet only to get frustrated and settle, you'll enjoy her perspective on investing in your look why it's so much bigger than just you, and why it's actually not as expensive as you think. We talk about shame triggers and how they keep you from doing the work you do, wardrobe building as an act of self-care, and becoming visually aligned with who you are. I met Megan in the 90-day year, and her work ethic inspires me so much. In our conversation, you'll get a behind-the-scenes look at how she went from burned-out employee to creating a very lucrative location-independent business and recently relocated her family from busy Chicago to the fresh air and mountains of Telluride, Colorado. So enjoy, and I will see you on the other side. Greetings, Megan. Hi, Dana. How are you? I'm doing really well. How are you? I'm great. Thank you for asking. I'm super happy that you're here and that we're having this conversation today. Yeah, I'm, I'm very excited. Cool. Great. Okay, so what I would like to really touch on today is some of the leaps that you've made in the past few years in your personal life and with your business. And then I would like to jump into some of the transformative work that you do with your business. Okay. Great. Okay. So I thought it was super exciting and super cool when you made a leap from living in Chicago to moving to Colorado last year in 2016. Mm -hmm. How did you make that decision? Why did you decide to go there? Um, the decision was really based on um, just a long time dream of my husband. Um, my husband and I had this dream of moving back to Colorado. So I went to grad school here um, and fell in love. And so moved back to Chicago for work. Cause that's where our family is. And, you know, we, my business wasn't always virtual. And so we worked really hard for, a while to make it, um, mostly virtual so we could do that. And I knew that being in a space where nature is really accessible and, um, where all the things that we love are really accessible would be, you know, not only a positive impact on, um, our lives, but on the business as well. So has it had the outcome or have you experienced the results that you thought you would experience? Oh, for sure. 
Um, I mean, moving is always challenging, but it's, you know, and it's hard to tie, you know, exact um, returns on the decisions you make because there's so many, there's so many facets. But um, yeah, I mean, this year, our business has more than doubled over last year. And it's, it's really about, I think, um, when you do something, when you actually take the steps to do something before you're ready to, um, it kind of triggers something inside of you that is like beyond fear, or I would say it's beyond fear, but it helps, um, it helps you just be a little bit braver in everything that you do. And I think that that is what has really contributed to, um, have, you know, to the move, having a positive impact on the business. Yes, absolutely. So you felt like you moved to Colorado before you were ready? Oh yeah. Um, Hmm. yeah. I mean, for a million reasons, but yes, (laughs) yes. Huh, that's interesting. Okay. And before starting Watson Style Group, you worked in a corporate environment, didn't you? Um, so yes, I mean, I worked for, I worked for, um, a small branding firm in the West Loop of Chicago and we worked within corporate environments. So, um, what I knew, you know, the work that I did was mainly with executives and with organizations that had thousands of employees, um, who needed guidance on, um, telling their employees or, educating their employees on dress code and business professional dress, business casual dress, and so on. Hmm. So then obviously at some point you decided that that wasn't working out for you and that you wanted to make the leap to entrepreneurship. So how did you land on that as your next step? Did you feel ready to start your business when you did? Um, so how it happened is that I was extremely burnt out um, as a lot of people, as a lot of people get to in, in that type of working environment. Um, so really long hours and very little self-care, very little sleep. Um, and also just, I think, you know, I was so much younger then and fresh out of grad school and hadn't really still in that mentality of graduate, get a job, graduate, get a job, graduate, get a job. Not really. What am I what am I here to be doing? Mm -hmm. Um, and so I really, I got, I got pretty sick. Um, and that's what facilitated it all. And so, um, it was difficult to figure out what was wrong. And so, um, I took time off because I was really kind of going to the doctor full time. Um, so there wasn't time Mm -hmm. to work. And so I focused on getting better and, what that led to was, um, like, I I mean, I did different yoga retreats. I did different self-development courses. I read lots of books. I mean, things that I would have never gotten into. Um, yeah, I saw that you are a yoga instructor. Did that come about during this time? Yeah, I, yeah, I ended up doing yoga teacher training for six (laughs) weeks. Um, I mean, just things that like, I just, me as a person took a complete 180 turn. Um, that that is not who I was when I was younger and working. And um, so it was, I mean, all of that led to an incredible amount of healing um, and really changed who I was um, Mm. in a very, very profound way. And so, um, yeah, after, you know, this kind of spans a couple of years, but I definitely got to the point where I could look back and be really grateful for getting sick. Um, and it was within that time frame that my business started. So what happened is that I had people who, you know, I've, I've been styling for a long time now, you know, over a decade. And I've had people from, from past, from, from just different kind of venues reach out to me. Um, and ask, can you do this project? Can you do this project? Um, and kind of just slowly starting to say yes to those things. So it was very much a side gig for a long time. Um, and I had the thoughts of, I can keep doing this and 
Um, it's kind of a nice thing to have. I'll be a mom. I'll have kids. <laughs> I'll continue to do my side thing. Um, and then it turned into something so much bigger. So that's really how the business got started. Hmm. Now, when you say it became something so much bigger, was that by choice or by necessity? Like, were you just like that busy where it kind of had no choice but to grow into a full scale business? Um, that's an interesting question. And I would say it's, I would say it's both. Um, hmm. I, I wanted it. I wanted it to be bigger. Um, I wanted to impact more people. I wanted to change the way, um, change the way I was operating. Um, and just, I just had a much bigger vision for what, you know, what Watson style group could become. Um, which at the time wasn't Watson style group because it was still a one woman show doing everything. But, um, yeah, it just, it got super exciting and it wasn't something it was far too, in my eyes, it was far too impactful to keep it as this kind of small, quiet side job. Mm, yes. I love that. Absolutely. Huh. And then now around building a team, like your husband, he works within the company now too, doesn't he? He does. So, which was not, which was not accidental, but kind of, <laughs> um, he, he stopped his corporate job to go to med school actually. Um, and within the transition of having our first child and, um, he would be starting school, gosh, I don't know. I mean, months after that. So within that kind of lapse of time, he started working with me, um, mostly as kind of a second set of hands while I had a newborn. Um, and what happened was that, um, in that time, the business actually grew a lot. Um, he has a sales background, so he made a really significant impact on what we were doing mm. and also was having a lot of fun. So we kind of had this, um, this moment where we're like, I don't, you know, you going back to school means 10 years of me basically being a single mom, not mm -hmm. seeing you. Um, and you're having so much fun. So let's just see where this goes. You know, we could always, you could always make the decision to go in a year or whatever. Um, and that was two years ago. So, huh. <laughs> um, so yeah, he's definitely full. This is, this is his, um, this is his gig too. That's really cool. And that gives you guys the opportunity to spend more time with your super cute little son then too, doesn't it? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, it, it does. I mean, we're so grateful for the logistics of our life because it does. It, it allows it allows that. It allowed me to, because the business was mostly virtual at the time, it was, you know, while we still had to have childcare, I was able to nurse him and, you know, cause he's just in another room and it's just all of those things that a lot of mothers don't get. I just am so, so, so grateful for. Yeah, absolutely. And then, so in this process somewhere, you've also had to build a team and that's something that it sounds like you wanted to take on because you had a big vision for your business, but tell us what that transition is like going from being the solopreneur, I can do everything myself to save money and <laughs> get it done to, you know, trusting that you can give some of those tasks away and have them done really well and just step into this new place. Yeah. So it definitely wasn't a graceful transition. Um, and even though, you know, my, my background or my formal education is in, um, business, I just, it, it, that's so different from being an entrepreneur and you kind of like think, you know, it all. And just because you are good at numbers and being able to look at profitability and such. But so what happened is that, um, it kind of started our very first team member was when I was still doing in-person and I was pregnant and, um, it's, it's actually a pretty physical job because you're taking, when I mean, you're shopping, um, you're carrying thousands of dollars of clothes, you're going to people's homes, you're carrying rolling racks. And so it got to the point where um, I, my husband was like, you, you can either hire an assistant or you really shouldn't be doing this anymore because it's just not safe. Like you need help. Mm -hmm. um, so I hired an assistant. 
who would come with me to appointments and carry, carry my things and, you know, carry the heavy boxes and all of that. And so, and the idea was that she could check my email while I took, you know, my two weeks off to, um, have the baby. So that was kind of the first leap into hiring someone. And then what we ended up hiring, um, coaches, marketing coaches, which every single business owner, no matter how big, whether it's a one woman show or, you know, 50 plus people should do for sure. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, we hired them and what we wanted was help developing another sales funnel. And, you know, they evaluated our business and they were like, we could send you all of the leads in the world. Um, but your business will implode. You don't have the, the staff to sustain this. I mean, mm. you're already completely maxed out. Like how many more clients can you service? Mm. And, you know, given the month, sometimes it's one or two and it's like, so you're really not ready for the growth you're asking for. So instead of focusing on lead generation and creating a new sales funnel, we spent, mm, gosh, I would say six months, six plus months developing a hiring strategy. Mm. Um, cause I was really hesitant to bring on another stylist. Um, cause the way in which I do, um, the way in which our programs are run are, are really quite different from traditional styling. And so I was, um, I wasn't sure that we could find someone with a traditional styling background to come in and, and support and serve in the same way that, you know, I had been doing. And so it took a really long time and a lot of interviewing to find that first stylist. Um, I think we went through about 25 candidates before we found one. Mm. Um, and she's still with us. She's amazing. And so from there we hired, um, we, we have a team of seven people now, but, um, you know, then it went to assistance and, we have a shipping manager and we have, um, you know, people who do tech and there's, there's all of these different components and it's, it's so great once they're in place, but the process of scaling is by far the most difficult thing, um, I've ever had to do in the business because it's just, it's scary and it's a lot of trial and error. Um, so it's so worth it, but it is, it's, it's super challenging. Yeah. And I would add too, that you do it in such a visible way when you take on the accountability of a team. So as you have like little hiccups around the, or along the way and like building structures, it's like, it's not just you to deal with them. It's like the accountability to the people who you're trying to set up with a clean and functional working process. Right. Right. It's like there's, they're growing pains and you just have to you just have to accept that they're going to happen as difficult as it is. And like I said, I didn't, it, it, I did not do it gracefully. Um, Mm. kind of every mistake that happened felt very, um, (laughs) world ending, but it's just, it's just part of the process if you want to grow. Yeah. Yeah. So do you feel like now that you're more graceful with the, the learning curves, the hiccups? Oh, I do. And it's, we, you know, we spent this weekend, um, we're, we're getting a little break. My, my, um, my parents are watching our son. And so we had a little break to do some strategic planning and, um, kind of planning out the next year. Um, cause we're expecting another child in November. And so oh, congratulations. Thanks. And so I wanted, um, it just, I want to plan and I want to make sure, um, you know, that I can take a good leave and everything is going to be functioning and fluid and, and feel really great. And so we have a hiring plan for the next year. And so we have three hires to make before November and then two more hires to make before March, 2018, and then four more before August, 2018. So it's, It's definitely we're at the time if if that was if I had seen that plan last year, I would have been no, I just would have opted to not do it. Um, But after going through it, it's it is possible. And so um, you kind of just you you create a system, a hiring system that works. And then 
you tweak it after the first hire and you tweak it after the second hire. And then, you know, eventually it's kind of rolling for you. So kudos, because that is a, that's a big leap. That's a big vision. Mm -hmm. So what is it that, what drives the work that you do with Watson Styling Group? Watson Style Group, why do you want it to, what, what's the outcome that you would like to have or the impact that you would like to have through the work that you do? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, boiled down to the basic level, you know, our mission is to change the way women get dressed. And really what that does is that it, it frees up, um, this incredible amount of energy that that a woman typically puts into the way she looks and presents herself to the world. Um, really, I would say our work took a turn when I read, um, I've been following Brene Brown's work for years and I'm a huge, huge fan. And when she talks about shame triggers, she what she what she focuses on is that they keep you from being um, what she calls in the arena. Um, and so she talks about how that, that trigger. So the trigger of, you know, how I look and how that's making you feel and um, layered with body image issues that it's keeping you from speaking up, from doing the work you're meant to do from being brave, from being vulnerable, you know, all of these things that lead to, um, a really wholehearted way to live. And so when I heard this and I heard, um, you know, the empirical evidence of, of what, of how women are affected by appearance and body image, um, I really knew that I had to focus our work a little more on addressing that because there'd always been a gap for me in, you know, people thinking that personal styling is somewhat trivial, um, even though I know that it's not, you know, even though I've seen the impact it's made on women's lives. And so, but that still, that still stood. And so when I was able to kind of dive deeper into her work, um, and really see kind of how powerful it is when women start to address some of these, some of these triggers so that they don't keep them from speaking up and being brave and, and doing the hard work they're here to do. Um, that's how, um, that's how I started to shift our programs. And that really led to kind of why we do this work. Um, it's, it's because there's really incredible, um, there's really incredible people out there. There's really incredible women serving, um, serving others in these really profound ways. And if there's something that I can do to make their work, um, make their lives easier, make their work, um, more easily received by, by the audience, um, all of that dials into how we are presenting ourselves visually and how we feel about it, how, um, the message that it sends. And so that's, that's really kind of the bottom line of, of what we do. Yeah. So, <clears throat> excuse me, when I was watching a video yesterday in preparation for this conversation today, I saw that one of the traits that you look for in the women that you work with is that they have a clearly defined mission. Yes. Yes, that's correct. Because then you help them identify the best clothing options for them based on the objectives they'd like to accomplish? Um, it's, we use a mission a little differently. So the reason why we want, you know, the women that we work with, the reason why we want them to have a mission or support them in identifying one is because that becomes the guiding force for the work that we do. So, or another way to say that is that becomes the bar that we hold for them. So when you have this mission, the, the work that you're doing, whether it be um, work on your visual presence, whether it be work on your, um, gosh, all of the different facets, it could be different facets that you're working on your business. It could be developmental work you're doing on sales or um, any type of personal development, 
that work that you're doing becomes less about you. It becomes less about, okay, I'm buying this necklace for me. I'm buying this beautiful pair of shoes for me. Um, it becomes, I'm, I'm addressing these visual attributes. I'm addressing the way that I want to look because it's going to serve this mission. It's going to serve. And we're able to tie that back to, you know, this, this becomes an act of self care. You are the vessel at which this mission will be accomplished. So we need to take care of you to, you know, to our greatest ability. And so that's how the, that's where the mission comes in. It becomes this bar and it becomes, it becomes the way we alleviate, you know, really the guilt that can be associated with, um, buying clothing for ourselves or doing something that feels a little bit indulgent because it's not about being indulgent. It's not about being frivolous or being wasteful or, you know, consuming at this high rate. It's about taking care of the person that you are so that you can accomplish this mission. Um, and how we select the clothing. Yeah. The mission, of, you know, can impact that, but the way the clothing gets selected is, um, through a process of uncovering values, ideal feelings, um, and attributes that really resonate with you. So it can be anything from nature. It can be the things that you love to do from hiking to reading to cooking. Um, all of those things get mixed together to create um, an aesthetic representation that is designed to be kind of the best fit for you. So it's not really our job or your job to come up with, oh, I like the way that dress looks and I like the way this person dresses. It's it's about kind of diving in and finding really these more core elements. And then our job is to ascribe the way those will look visually. Um, huh. And that's, yeah. Wow. Yeah, that that is so powerful. That's such a unique way to come at it. Yeah, it's, we, it's done a little differently. And I, I do think that that, I would say that it's that process change that I would attribute to the success that we have, because it really, it really takes the pressure off of the both individuals, um, and takes it off of, um, are you going to like this? Are they going to like this? Is my audience going to like this? Because it's, it's you we're representing and there's really no, you know, you at your core are perfect. And so if we can really capture that, then there's no, it's really uncommon for someone to not like that image that we've created because mm -hmm. it's, it, it's based on them. Um, it's not something we've liked and planted on them, which happens quite, you know, that can happen with, especially with editorial styling. It's just, let's create something beautiful and put it here. Um, which that has that old, you know, these, this different objectives, but when it comes to personal styling, it really has to be pulled from the person or it's not going to do its job. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So then you mentioned that the wardrobe is like a secret weapon to becoming the best and the bravest version of yourself. Um, mm -hmm. so how, how is it that through this work, you help women accomplish that objective? Well, it's, that's kind of the perfect segue from what we were just talking about, which is, you know, because, because this image, this new wardrobe is a representation of who you are. It's, it, it always happens where we're on our try on session and, you know, they're commenting on this outfit is beautiful or this skirt is beautiful or my look book is beautiful. Um, and it's, it's at that moment that we have the opportunity to tell them that, we really love that you think it's beautiful. We really love that you like it. But the part you have to remember that this is you. This is, if you think that this whole vision, this whole lookbook is beautiful, it's because it's a representation of who you are, the way the colors were combined, the way the textures were combined. And so if, if they can, if they can accept that and believe that and embody that and, and, you know, allow that to be, um, the reminder of every time they get dressed is oh, I really like what I'm wearing. And this is a representation of just how amazing I am. Um, that's how we can begin to 
um, always step into, you know, it's, it's step into our best and bravest selves. It's not someone you need to become. It's someone you already are that you just need to allow yourself to be or allow mm-hmm. yourself to realize or allow yourself to show other people. Um, and so that's, that's how we do that. So how does a woman know when she is ready to step it up and t- take this next step with her wardrobe and the way that she physically presents herself to the world? Um, I think it's just listening to the experience you're having when, um, you know, I think it, I think it happens first for most people when they're out and about with other people, whether it's at a networking event or on a date or at a conference or whatever it might be. Um, really taking note of what conversations happening in your head, because it's going to happen subconsciously first, hmm. um, before it gets to the conscious place of, and sometimes they, they make, they don't make that realization until we're on the phone talking. And it's like, yeah, I, I was questioning my shoes that day. And, and, and again, I just want to repeat that none of this is silly, that all of us do this, everyone, um, or the, the, you know, the 80 plus the 80% plus of us who are visually oriented. And so it's, it's not silly that you're making the realization that, yeah, I was questioning my shoes. Um, and I realized that I had a little hole in my sweater. And so I talked to less people at that networking event. I kind of stayed quiet. Um, I, you know, when I went to the bathroom, I looked at my hair and I kind of sighed. And so then I would just went back and sat at my table instead of, you know, mingling with other people. And it's just these kind of subtle things that affect your ability to communicate in a really um, meaningful way. Um, and so I think it's noticing. And then the second part is when you're getting dressed in the morning. You know, most of us are getting dressed in, in some point in the first half of our day. And if you're noticing like what that experience is like for you, is it frustrating? Um, is it fun? Is it, um, is it beyond frustrating? Is it to the point where it's, it's kind of a little bit debilitating where you're then just opting for, um, maybe yoga pants or, or something that you don't want to be putting on because it's just, you're, you're, you're in there with the intention of I'm going to get dressed. And then you retreat from that intention because you just can't find something. And so I think it's noticing, is that really how I want to be starting my day? Mm. Um, we started with a really amazing, amazing woman. And she kind of really vulnerably shared with us that, um, that the way she was dressing was even affecting, like making eye contact at the grocery store. And, Mm. you know, we, we all got to this emotional place on the call because she's just such an incredible person. Um, and so sweet. And she's really doing the world a disservice by, by not engaging with other people because other people engaging with her will for sure make their day better. Um, and so I think that you have to really honor, um, who you are and what you want to be doing. And if the way you look is impacting that in any way, um, knowing that it's okay to want to address that. It's okay to ask for help to address that. It's okay that, um, yes, it's visual and yes, it has to do with clothing, but that you are amongst a bunch of other amazing women who are having the same issue. Okay, we'll take a step back for just a second here. For this part of the conversation, Megan and I discuss who is a good fit for working with a personal stylist, what that can look like, how you can customize your experience to what you really need so you can live at the level you prefer. And she also sheds light on why working with a stylist can actually save you money. So let's dive back in and hear what Megan has to say. It's funny. It's, I think that um, someone wrote a testimonial before for us, and I forget her exact words, but she was like, I definitely thought working with a stylist was for celebrities. Hmm. Um, and she kind of made this comment how she's only a stay at home mom and all of this stuff. And I, you know, especially being a mother, there's, there's nothing true about saying you're only a stay at home mom. I mean, Mm -hmm. you are like running the world when you're a mother and working to do all of those things. And so, but 
that was her comment. You know, I used to think this was only for celebrities, but we've done, we've done silly things from like, t- one of my favorites was we did a, we did a lookbook that was titled T-Ball Wardrobe. And it's because this woman was busy. She had two boys and she had to go to T-Ball games every single weekend. And she was like, I just want something cute and comfortable that can get dirty and my shoes are comfy. Um, and it's not silly to be asking a professional to do that for you because hmm. your time is your time is better spent with those two boys or having fun or doing fulfilling work. That's kind of the whole thing is that it's not just for it's for people who wear clothes um, and who are, you know, at that, like we talked about earlier, at that place of I'm, I'm ready to make a bigger impact in my life. Let's start to see the things that I can hand off um, or that really I'm not doing at the level I need to be, you know, to be um, living the, the life at the level that I want. So it's, yeah, it's an interesting, it's an interesting um, stereotype, I would say. I mean, and not that, you know, it does when you work with a personal stylist, yes, you're going to be purchasing clothing. So there's the act of spending money. Mm -hmm. Um, But I've had a lot of clients say that, um, and they've like, we have numbers, they've given numbers, but where the year, because typically people work with us for a full year, the year they've worked with us, they spent less money um, because they're not out trialing all of these things it's like, Oh, I have a speaking engagement. I better go get a dress. So, mm. okay. You drop X amount on a dress that you don't know how to wear again, or it really wasn't great in the first place, but your flight was leaving, you know, in the morning. So mm-hmm, you had mm-hmm. to get it. Um, so when people who are kind of really into their personal finances, look at like, wow, I, I actually spent less doing this. Um, and I would say for people who have a lot of visual engagement, that tends to be the case. Um, cause you're not, you know, I had a client who was hopping, they'd fly to their location that they were going to, whether it was for a conference or a speaking engagement, and then pop into a store when they got there to find something to wear, like, oh my gosh, why don't you just go and enjoy a good dinner and, mm. <laughs> or prepare, prepare for what you're going to say instead of compiling this, these mounds of clothing. And then they, they, they wouldn't get worn again because it's like, it was a str- it was purchased under stress and then it has this negative connotation to it. So it's it's really interesting the way the shopping patterns that get created. Wow. Yeah, that's powerful. Cool. Well, Megan, I think we covered everything that I had on my mind. Is there anything else that you wanted to share? Um, no, I don't think so. We we talked a lot. This was a really this was a really great conversation. Great. Yeah, I think so, too. Um, So for anyone who wants to get in touch with you, maybe check out some of your work, reach out if they feel inclined, how would they do that? Um, The very the very best way to do that is um, to go to watsonstylegroup.com forward slash styling dash session. Um, And this is kind of just where you can learn about what it is that we do. So one of the other unique things that we do is that um, everyone gets anyone who um, has an interest in personal styling gets to experience us complimentary. Um, And I feel like that's the best way to see if, you know, to let people test the water, so to say of styling, personal styling feels great. This this Watson style group is a fit, isn't a fit. Um, and so that's the best way because that will kind of give you the info you need and allow you to actually get questions answered. Mm. Okay, great. Well, Megan, thank you so much for coming on today. Yeah. Thank you for having me and your, your great questions. It was, um, it was really fun to talk about. Well, thank you and have a great day. Yeah. Thank you, Dana. Take care. Did today's topic inspire you, encourage you, or challenge you to look at your own processes in a different way? Join us in our Facebook group to continue the conversation. It's where all the good stuff happens after the show. It's theaudacityofshe.com slash Facebook. Again, that's theaudacityofshe.com slash Facebook. See you there.